Manuel. <laughs> well done. Thank you, Dana. <laughs> the final frontier becomes the next frontier for the U.S. military. Russia says new U.S. sanctions over the poisoning of a spy are unacceptable. And a deeply disturbing look inside the mind of the teenager behind the Parkland High School massacre. This is Special Report. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Mike Emanuel in for Brett Baer. A new kind of space race is underway tonight, and it is much more concerned with weapons and war than peace and exploration. The Trump administration is formally launching its new military branch called the Space Force amid what the vice president calls a crowded and adversarial landscape. Correspondent Kristen Fisher starts us off tonight with what could be an epic and expensive expansion of the Pentagon's power and responsibility. Good evening, Kristen. Hey, Michael, we're talking about a major reorganization of the U.S. military. The Trump administration wants to create an entirely new branch for the first time since the Air Force was established in 1947. Back then, dominance in the air was a game changer in World War II. Now, the vice president says it's dominance in space. That's how the battles of the future will be won and lost. The time has come to write the next great chapter in the history of our armed forces to prepare for the next battlefield. Vice President Mike Pence stood before top military brass at the Pentagon today and told them that President Trump wants his space force up and running in just two years. The space environment has fundamentally changed in the last generation. What was once peaceful and uncontested is now crowded and adversarial. He blames China and Russia for developing and testing weapons that could destroy American satellites, which the U.S. military and economy depend on for communicating, navigating, and intelligence. While our adversaries have been busy weaponizing space, too often we have bureaucratized it. But opponents, like former Air Force Secretary Deborah Lee James, who served in the Obama administration, argue the president's proposal would only add to the red tape. The creation of a brand new separate service, I believe, a brand new bureaucracy, would create such thrashing within the bureaucracy that we could actually lose some of the positive momentum that we've seen over the last several years. It's a point Defense Secretary Jim Mattis supported just last year, but he's come around and now supports the president's plan to to create a space operations force, a new unified combatant command, a space development agency for acquisitions, and a new political appointee, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space. We are in complete alignment with the president's concern about protecting our assets. And at a rally in Ohio over the weekend, President Trump hinted at more aggressive action in orbit. I'm talking about tremendous defense capability, offensive capability. The move to militarize space has raised concerns of a celestial arms race. Weapons, enter weapons free. But experts agree, Space Force or no Space Force, the U.S. already confronts strategic threats. The fact is that Russia and China have been actively developing anti-satellite weapons for a number of years. The Trump administration is now calling on Congress to allocate $8 billion over the next five years. Ultimately, Congress must act. The big question now is, will Congress actually fund it? Now, the Trump campaign is already trying to make some money off today's announcement. They sent an email to supporters asking them to vote on a Space Force logo. They can then buy the winning design on a new line of Space Force gear, which will be sold on the campaign's website. So this idea has become hugely popular among the president's supporters. They see it as making America great again, this time in space. Mike? And Kristen, we know that the folks at the Pentagon are already working on the budgeting. Kristen Fisher, thanks for leading us off. You bet. One of America's primary rivals in space, Russia, is not happy with new U.S. sanctions over its alleged poisoning of a former spy. Moscow says it is already working on retaliatory measures. Correspondent Kevin Cork tells us where things stand tonight from the White House. Sanctions is a way that we can try to encourage better behavior on the part of, a, of government. This is one tool that we have in a very uh, big toolkit. By enacting sweeping new sanctions against Russia following the near fatal nerve agent attack on British soil against a former Russian spy, the Trump administration sent the Kremlin a clear message. Moscow's destabilizing behavior carries a heavy price. Already reeling from a host of international sanctions, Moscow further recoiled at Washington's latest salvo, a Kremlin spokesman calling the new U.S. sanctions draconian, unfriendly, insisting that Washington had become 
become an unpredictable player on the international stage. U.S. statements that they are ready to continue improving relations look grotesque. That is barefaced hypocrisy. Zakharova's complaint comes just weeks after Presidents Trump and Putin met face to face in Helsinki, Finland, in an effort to improve dialogue between the two countries. But in a Washington political environment, a Washington Russian collusion talk, and pressure from both the left and the right on Capitol Hill, the Trump White House has remained aggressive, with Moscow on the receiving end of a sanctioned storm since President Trump took office, with 213 Russian related entities targeted. Penalties that included the expulsion of five dozen Russian diplomats and the closure of Russian consular facilities in New York, Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and Seattle. It's important that we maintain this kind of pressure uh, in order to deter any other nation that might use a nerve agent. This latest round of sanctions were imposed under a 1991 law that mandates the federal government sanction any country that has used or substantially prepares to use chemical or biological weapons. Just another way lawmakers are able to force the hand of the president whose dream of a real Russian reset appears to be fading away. Let's be live on the North Lawn. Kevin, how concerned are White House officials that more sanctions on the Kremlin could ultimately undermine any improvement in relations between the U.S. and Russia? Yeah, no question, Mike. They are deeply concerned, but they're also resolute to be candid that they feel like this is Russia's behavior. That's the main issue. And that's important, especially when you consider phase two of the sanctions are set to take effect in just 90 days, giving the Kremlin very little time to comply with U.S. demands, Mike. Very interesting. Kevin Cork, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. The Saudi-led coalition fighting Yemeni rebels is being blamed for an assault on a busy market today, killing nearly 50 people. Senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palcott takes a look at what happened. Children in a line of fire in Yemen. Airstrikes by the U.S.-backed Saudi-led Sunni Muslim coalition backing the country's beleaguered government hitting a bus in the north of the country. According to rebel officials and the Red Cross, 43 dead, including 29 kids. The strike happened in the middle of the market and it targeted a bus carrying children. The alliance claimed it was hitting missile launchers used by those Iranian-backed Shia Muslim Houthi rebels. Three-year-long civil and proxy wars killed 10,000, many civilians, many young, says the UN. There is no justification whatsoever to attack uh, children. The U.S. supplies weapons, logistics, and intelligence to the Saudi-led side for a reason. The Houthi rebels have targeted U.S. and other ships in the Red Sea with Iranian-made missiles. Analysts say Iran wants to expand its regional reach. New sanctions on Iran following the U.S. pullout from the nuclear deal could cut Iranian rebel support. Uh, renewed U.S. sanctions will have a significant impact on Iran's ability to finance its widespread surrogate network, including the Houthis in Yemen. The war is also complicating efforts to deal with one of the most dangerous chapters of al-Qaeda, the Yemen-based al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. After the U.S. military hit it hard last year, the group has regained ground in Yemen's chaos this year. The U.S. should support a political settlement in Yemen uh, so that the Yemeni government can focus on uh, combating al-Qaeda. Diplomacy is most important for the Yemeni people. The fighting has created what experts say is the biggest humanitarian crisis in the world. 22 million people desperate for food, water and medicine. The U.N. envoy to Yemen has, in fact, invited the warring sides to Geneva next month to try to find a political solution to the crisis. Good news, if it works, for a lot of reasons. Mike. No question. Greg Palcott, thanks very much. Venezuela is taking the unusual step of asking the U.S. for help tonight. It is seeking extradition for a man it accuses of masterminding last week's drone attack against President Nicolas Maduro. Tonight, we look at how Venezuela's economic and political crisis is sending hundreds of thousands of people across the border into Colombia. Correspondent Rich Edson is traveling with U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley and reports tonight from Bogota. 
Millions starving and sick are escaping Venezuela. Many to Colombian border towns like Cucuta, where we met refugee Maria Elena Lopez Gonzalez. Children are dying because of the shortage of medicine. The senior citizens are dying because of the shortage of medicine. We can't find food, everything is overpriced, and that is why the majority of Venezuelans are fleeing the situation. Others say they're escaping government oppression. We have left our country looking for a new horizon because they want to kill us. They have killed our families and hide everything that's happening around the world from Venezuela. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley visited relief efforts here. She blames the crisis on Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro and his socialist regime and proclaims it's time for Maduro to go. We're going to continue to let him know that what he's doing is wrong for the Venezuelan people and we're going to continue to fight for the freedoms and democracies that the Venezuelan people deserve. Every time we do it, it makes him angry. In an exclusive television interview with Fox News, Ambassador Haley says Maduro is committing mass atrocities in the way that he's managing his government and that other countries must increase their aid to Venezuelans and their pressure on Maduro. We need the international community to understand that the United States, yes, we've given 60 million. We're giving 9 million more today, but everyone needs to step up and everyone needs to be loud against Maduro and force him to leave. Despite an alleged attempt on his life this weekend, Maduro remains in power. Venezuelans at this Catholic kitchen say, as a result, the government has tightened control of society, a political and economic crisis where many choose to live on the streets in a foreign country over returning home. I've been caught in torrential downpours and I haven't found shelter. I live in the streets. We want to solve all these problems. We don't want free handouts. We want to work. About 40,000 Venezuelans will cross over this bridge from Venezuela into Colombia today. Some will stay here in Colombia, others will move to different Latin American countries, and many will return to Venezuela, having eaten and gotten their medicine here in Colombia. And that'll happen again tomorrow, as this crisis shows little sign of improving. Mike? Rich Edson, many thanks. We're waiting to hear from the special counsel regarding President Trump's conditions on agreeing to an interview. The president's lawyer said yesterday they have given Robert Mueller their terms. We offered him an opportunity to do a form of questioning. He can say yes or no. We can do it. If he doesn't want to do it, he knows the answers to every question that he wants to ask. He's going to ask him, did you tell Comey to go easy on Flint? The president is going to say, no, I didn't. Hey, Bob, you know it. <laughs> well, Why do you want to get him under oath? You think we're fools? You, you want to get him under oath because you want to trap him into perjury. Today, President Trump tweeted, this is an illegally brought rigged witch hunt run by people who are totally corrupt and or conflicted. It was started and paid for by crooked Hillary and the Democrats, phony dossier, FISA disgrace, and so many lying and dishonest people already fired. 17 angry Dems, stay tuned. The judge in the special counsel's prosecution of the president's former campaign chairman is becoming almost as big an issue tonight as the defendant. Correspondent Peter Ducey is in Alexandria, Virginia with the unusual details. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Mike. The Mueller team complained today that the judge who keeps giving them an earful is actually being harmful to their case. The special counsel's lawyers filed a motion in court accusing Judge T.S. Ellis of erroneously admonishing them after he called their side out when he found out a government witness had been hanging out in the courtroom with spectators before taking the stand. But since the judge apparently never said that was against the rules, the Mueller team alleged, quote, the mistake here prejudiced the government by conveying to the jury that the government had acted improperly and had violated court rules or procedures. Judge Ellis addressed the matter in court this morning somewhat apologetically. He said he may have made a mistake and that this robe doesn't make me anything other than human. Any criticism of counsel should be put aside. After the apology, the Mueller team introduced into evidence their first emoji. It was a frowny face tacked onto an email. Citizens Bank Vice President Peggy Maselli sent colleagues informing them that Paul Manafort's firm was in a cash crunch. That email was part of a mountain of documents. The Mueller team continues to make their case that Paul Manafort lied about how much debt he carried and how much income was coming in to trick banks into giving him millions of dollars worth of loans. One witness today from Airbnb 
also testified that a house Paul Manafort claimed his daughter was living in so he could save money on taxes was actually available on the site to be rented out indefinitely, including once for 21 days for more than $11,000. The Mueller team says they are going to be done making their case tomorrow once they call four or five more witnesses to the stand. Then it is the Manafort team's turn to call witnesses who could clear their client's name if they think they need to. We just caught up with Manafort's lawyer outside of court while he was leaving. He says he thinks today was a good day for the former Trump campaign chairman. Mike? Peter Ducey live on another fascinating day in federal court. Peter, thanks. The first batch of documents from Supreme Court nominee Judge Brett Kavanaugh's time in the George W. Bush White House has been released. The 5,700 pages are posted on the Senate Judiciary Committee's website. They are gleaned from 125,000 documents given to the committee on a confidential basis by a law lawyer for the former president. Democrats say Republicans are cherry picking from the initial cash. Up next, who benefits from a big new tax cut? First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox Kansas in Wichita, as Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach's lead over Governor Jeff Collier in the Republican primary shrinks to just 91 votes. Election officials discovered a mistake in the listing for one county's results. Authorities are still counting late arriving mail-in ballots and provisional ballots. Fox 28 in Columbus, as Ohio's elections chief says more than 8,000 potential votes are yet to be tallied in a congressional special election that ended too close to call. Republican Troy Balderson finished Tuesday with a razor thin lead of about 1,800 votes over Democrat Danny O'Connor. And this is a live look at New York from Fox 5. One of the big stories there tonight, Samsung announces a new smartphone it says is faster and will last longer without a recharge. The price tag for the Galaxy Note 9 is $1,000. The new phone comes out August 24th. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. In the media business tonight, Tribune has withdrawn from its nearly $4 billion merger with Sinclair. This stops Sinclair's bid to create a massive media juggernaut. Tribune Media is on the hook for a $135 million breakup fee. It says it is suing Sinclair for breach of contract and at least a billion dollars in damages. Stocks were mixed. The Dow lost 74 and a half. The S&P 500 dropped four. NASDAQ gained three. President Trump's real estate empire is just one of the companies that could benefit from a new tax break as part of last year's trillion and a half dollar tax cut. Deirdre Bolton of Fox Business Network joins us from New York with the details. Good evening, Deirdre. Good evening, Mike. The Treasury Department issued a report of the types of companies and professionals eligible to qualify as pass-through entities. Those get a 20% tax deduction. So there's a 184-page rule book that starts to define which types of businesses are eligible. It's really still too early to tell exactly who's going to get the break, since the law gives the IRS pretty wide leeway to interpret key provisions. But what is clear is that this tax law is is going to be affecting a lot of Americans. Pass-throughs account for more than half of American businesses and the vast majority of small businesses. So in most cases, the owners pay individual, not corporate tax rates on the income. Now, critics are sounding alarms. Groups on the left have responded saying the new rules will help wealthy Americans. In fact, a spokesperson for the Liberal Center for American Progress says this is a provision that we always thought would provide a windfall to high income taxpayers. These rules not only fail to change that outcome, but may in fact exacerbate it. Economists do estimate that nearly 70% of pass through income flows through to about the top 1%, Mike, of American earners. Now, some say the new rules are a potential win for the Trump Organization. Mm -hmm. How so? So one key part of the Treasury Department's new rules favor business groups that make money primarily on the reputation or the skill of their owners. The Trump Organization certainly includes that, includes hundreds of pass-through entities. Some of its income comes from licensing the owner's name, so the deduction may apply. Other possible winners and losers include architects and engineers who will probably get the break. 
Most accountants, doctors, and lawyers probably will not. Companies that lease their equipment rather than own it are also excluded. Basically, as more details emerge, distinctions will become clearer. But if you do have a small business, it is probably worth checking in with your accountants. Mike, there you go. You. Deirdre Bolton yeah. on the business beat. Thanks a lot. Sure thing. Japanese manufacturer Suzuki, Mazda, and Yamaha are admitting they used falsified emissions data to inspect their new vehicles after the Japanese government ordered the industry to review its procedures. Japan's transport ministry says the three companies admit conducting improper inspections after 23 Japanese auto and motorbike manufacturers were ordered to examine their inspection procedures in July. Now to a subject that affects virtually every one of us, online privacy. There is still no comprehensive legislation on the books, but that could soon change. Tonight, correspondent Jillian Turner takes a look at some of the first steps. Do companies have a responsibility to ensure more transparency of how they collect, use, and secure user data. Online privacy, it's the number one cyber threat to Americans, according to cybersecurity experts. For years, lawmakers on Capitol Hill have been threatening to write legislation to govern online privacy, but have come up short. But now, in the wake of major privacy abuses by Facebook and data breaches at Equifax, Wells Fargo, and other giants that cost Americans billions of dollars, the Trump administration stepping up to the plate. The White House telling Fox News, through the White House National Economic Council, the Trump administration aims to craft a consumer privacy protection policy that's the appropriate balance between privacy and prosperity. Insiders say the goal is to roll out a White House policy in the fall and have that policy serve as a blueprint for congressional legislation. On the Hill, Senators Mark Warner of Virginia and Richard Burr of North Carolina are taking the lead. They're advocating for a modern privacy protection policy. There's no committee of technology in Congress. There's no agency of technology in Washington. It all sort of dumps in our lap. Cyber experts caution that despite private sector lapses, regulation should have limits. What I wouldn't want us to do is to follow the European model of regulate first and ask questions later. Top policy priorities government-wide include rights for internet users, guidelines for what information companies can collect and how to collect it, and whether it can be shared with third parties. But private sector interests will have to factor in as well. I wouldn't want Congress to conclude that this is an opportunity to stick it to, to the technology companies, because that's not going to be a fruitful or productive way forward. So far this summer, the administration's convened over 80 companies, consumer advocacy groups, and trade associations in 22 separate meetings. They're also holding ongoing discussions with Google and Facebook and plan to ramp up their efforts next month. Mike? Jillian Turner, thanks very much. You bet. Up next, a frightening and disturbing look inside the mind of the Parkland High School shooter. First, beyond our borders tonight, Puerto Rico is now estimating that Hurricane Maria killed more than 1,400 people. That is far more than the official death toll of 64. The revelation is part of a report to Congress seeking billions of dollars to help the island recover from the devastating storm. Israeli warplanes struck dozens of targets in the Gaza Strip and three people were reported killed. Palestinian militants from the territory fired scores of rockets into Israel in a fierce burst of violence overnight. Palestinian officials say Israeli warplanes attacked a cultural center in Gaza City. North Korea leader Kim Jong-un and his wife are seen inspecting a fish pickling factory in images just released. They show Kim wearing a white t-shirt and hat, an unusually light and less formal outfit compared to the mouse-style suits he usually wears. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back. President Trump took a little time out of his vacation today to talk about prison reform with governors and state attorneys general. Our first duty is to our citizens, including those who have taken the wrong path, but are seeking redemption and a new beginning. The Trump administration has been pressing Congress to send legislation that would provide the Bureau of Prisons with $50 million over the next five years for drug treatment, education, and job skills programs. He also says he planned to go to a public park the week before to shoot a bunch of innocent people there, but backed out. His defense team still offers to plead guilty to everything to avoid the possibility of the death penalty, but the prosecutor is not taking it. Mike. Phil Keating in Miami. Thank you. On the other side of the country, California fire, fire officials say the largest blaze ever recorded in the state is now more than half contained. 
But they also say it will still take several weeks to fully surround the massive wildfire in Northern California because it's burning in steep terrain that is difficult to reach. In Southern California, a forest fire that has prompted evacuations in Canyon and Foothill neighborhoods continues to grow with minimal containment. Chief Correspondent Jonathan Hunt has our update tonight from Riverside. Burning south and east of Los Angeles, the Holy Fire continues to scorch forest land and threaten homes, more than doubling in size from Wednesday to Thursday. This shouldn't be called the Holy Jim Fire, this should be called the Holy Hell Fire. Today, 51-year-old Forrest Gordon Clark was due in court, charged with starting the fire, which has scorched more than a dozen square miles and destroyed 12 cabins. As the Holly Fire took hold, Clark was filmed shouting at firefighters, accusing them of taking money from his property. And as firefighters continue to battle the flames here in Riverside County, the political firefight is also becoming more intense. The spark for that, a tweet from the president. Mr. Trump claimed firefighters didn't have enough water because, he said, it was being diverted to the Pacific Ocean as part of California's environmental protection policies. The California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, or CAL FIRE, responded by saying firefighters have plenty of water, and politicians like Senator Dianne Feinstein dismissed the president's comments. Well, that's nonsense. But now the administration is ordering the National Marine Fisheries Service to, quote, facilitate access to water for firefighting in California. In a directive, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross says, quote, the protection of life and property takes precedence over any current agreements regarding the use of water in the areas of California affected by wildfires. Environmentalists worry the directive is part of a longer-term administration plan to weaken protections for endangered species. And while the politics of this plays out, the 14,000 firefighters on the front lines remain focused on what for them is a far more immediate battle. In Riverside County, California, Jonathan Hunt, Fox News. The U.S. and Russia in another dispute, this time over new sanctions. We'll get reaction from the all-star panel when we come back. We'd like to have a better relationship with the Russian government, recognizing that we have a lot of areas of mutual concern. It is a major country. We are a major country as well. And so when you have that, you are forced to have to have conversations uh, with other governments. And sanctions is a way that we can try to encourage better behavior on the part of a of government. The Russian side has warned on numerous occasions that the policy of force and ultimatums is worthless and counterproductive. The Russian side will start to work on retaliatory measures to unfriendly moves made by Washington. So we can assume that the State Department spokeswoman and the Russian Foreign Ministry spokeswoman will agree to disagree. It's been a busy year in terms of Russian sanctions. We've got a graphic we can show you taking a look at the recap of this year. Back in January, they targeted individuals and entities related to Russia's occupation of Crimea. March, individuals and entities for malicious cyber activity. April, oligarchs and government officials for malign activity worldwide. June, individuals and entities for enabling Russia's Federal Security Service. And now in August, Russian Bank for facilitating transactions related to North Korea. With that, let us bring in our panel, Byron York, Chief Political Correspondent of the Washington Examiner, Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief at USA Today, and Eli Lake, columnist for Bloomberg View. Eli, your thoughts. My thoughts are that this is uh, the, the Russian sanctions. It's a step in the right direction, and uh, it shows that the Trump administration's policy is often much tougher than the president's own rhetoric. And you know, as far as the question of will the reset be possible, let's hope not. Russia has been uh, becoming more and more brazen in its activities, particularly against its neighbors, particularly against Europe. And uh, at this point, we should give up the fantasy that you know we're going to be able to cooperate with Russia on these things. They're an adversary; they have to be contained. 
Susan, your thoughts on U.S.-Russia relations as of today? You know, it's perplexing, though, to see the disconnect between President Trump's rhetoric about Russia and the actions his administration has taken with, with these sanctions. Now, this was, of course, required under a, a 1991 law. They delayed it for a while. You know, the, the, it was supposed to start a 60-day clock when they concluded that uh, Russia was responsible for this uh, incident of, of poisoning. They took about 90 days to do it. But I guess it is a sign of the limits of the power, even of a, a president as forceful as President Trump to uh, shape policy when there are laws in places and other forces that want to go in a different direction. We have uh, Heather Nauert talking about what happens if Russia does not admit wrongdoing in 90 days. Take a listen to that. We don't forecast sanctions. We will comply with the law. We are well aware of what the law contains. We will comply with the law, but I'm not going to get ahead of what could happen 90 days from now. Byron, your thoughts? Uh, can we put aside the notion that the Trump administration is soft uh, on Russia? This new stuff follows all of these these sanctions that you just went through, um, which also uh, are on top of measures like arming Ukraine or sending more troops to Eastern uh, Europe or working on a new intermediate range missile, all of these things that are uh, against Russian interests. So uh, I cannot explain the president's performance in Helsinki, but there's it's clear that his administration's policies, not only in sanctions, but actually in policies that, that affect Russia, are pretty tough. The House Foreign Affairs Chairman Ed Royce of California talked about the importance of maintaining pressure on Russia. It's important that we maintain this kind of pressure uh, in order to deter any other nation that might use a nerve agent, that might use a chemical and biological weapon uh, on, uh, foreign, on, on U.S. soil or on our allies' soil. So Eli, what kind of message does this send to the Kremlin? I think it sends the message to the Kremlin that despite the environment of Helsinki and what, you know, that, that sort of kind of cringeworthy performance there with, you know, that we saw, that the U.S. government is in a very different place. But I would say that, you know, these sanctions, we kind of need to go further. We need to th rethink something that Democrats and Republicans sort of assumed after the Cold War, which was a good thing to integrate Russia into international institutions, that this would somehow get them to live up to the standards that we hold our allies to. They undermine these international institutions, and we need to start thinking about trying to quarantine Russia from these sorts of international institutions. You know, no country's ever been kicked out of the United Nations, that's too far, but certainly we should start thinking about trying to kick them out of things like, you know, the International Olympics Commission, things like that over time, because they've really proven that they're, at least at this point, has no interest in acting like a civilized state. There's a decent amount of anxiety in this town about the U.S. commitment to NATO uh, versus the commitment or the working relations with Moscow. Uh, take a listen to this from a California Democrat. This uh, NDAA uh, really uh, puts a very clear sign out there that we're standing strong with NATO. The sanctions add to that. Uh, this is very, very important. It's absolutely clear that uh, Putin will push wherever he sees weakness. And we don't want any weakness, period, uh, in the uh, NATO issue or in the European alliance. So, Susan, a rare case of bipartisanship wanting pressure on Russia? Well, bipartisanship uh, you saw on the part of the Hill. We haven't heard from President Trump about this. And I think it must be perplexing to foreign leaders to hear a different message come from the president than the, than the actions taken by the institutions he heads. He continues to, to say that better relations with Russia would be in, in our interest. He continues to talk about another meeting with Vladimir Putin after the midterm election. So I think foreign leaders must look at that and wonder who they're supposed to believe. We've seen, Byron, over the years, a number of U.S. presidents wanting to get better relations with Moscow, but um, where are we now? No, well, it doesn't work, and, it, and it's not going to work. But uh, I think the Russians should understand that apart from the craziness of the Trump-Russia affair, I think there's a fair amount of, of unity behind a lot of these measures toward Russia. You just saw that with uh, Representative Garamendi, the, the, the Democrat. Uh, there's a lot of bipartisan support for this stuff. And now, if the Russians wanted to divide the U.S. political system over the Trump-Russia affair, they've really hit a home run. But So there's just no unity at all there. But the rest of Russia policy, there is a lot of bipartisan support. And that these days is pretty rare, especially in a, an election year. Next up, the Space Force.